Well, we're out here in the middle of a really nice looking watermelon patch and actually it's a research plot that we have some really interesting things going on on. This is Dennis Scott. Many of you remember Dennis uh, who works with us on Oklahoma Gardening. Dennis is a graduate student in the Department of Horticulture at OSU and the one that's really in charge of making our Oklahoma Gardening studio look nice. He's done an excellent job and remember last year at about this time Dennis was on the show and giving us some information on how seedless watermelons are developed because part of his research involves seedless watermelons. Is that correct, right. Dennis? That is. But it's also a much broader scope than that. And I think your, your research study is really interesting. I'd like for you to kind of tell us what you're, what you're looking at out here in these watermelons. Well, I love to talk about my research, <laughs> so that'd be fine. Basically, what we're looking at is calcium nutrition in watermelon. Uh, many of you that have grown plants or fruits, especially tomatoes, peppers, and watermelons, will be familiar with a disorder called blossom end rot. It is believed that blossom end rot is associated with calcium nutrition. Mm -hmm. Poor calcium nutrition increases the amount of the disorder that you'll see. This is very common in certain watermelons, especially uh, this, which is a Charleston gray melon, very small, that you can see the disorder is on the end. It is on the blossom end of the fruit, as the name implies. The tissue becomes brown and necrotic, and uh, secondary pathogens, disease, move into it very easily, and you have a fruit that's useless to the grower or to the homeowner. Now, this Charleston Gray is, of course, not a normal size, no. and because of this, it would be really a, a rather large, cylindrical-looking, nice-looking melon, and you've got some really nice ones out here. Yeah, in fact, they will be 25, 30 pounds is very common and very long. So this came out of a plot where you didn't either didn't have the calcium treatment or you had a lower calcium treatment, is that correct? Right. This was out of a plot that had the lowest amount of added calcium, and so I hope that there's a lot of this in that plot. Yeah, yeah which would be probably a natural occurring phenomenon then if calcium was not added to it. Right, right. The study then is to help us understand that for mm -hmm. the benefit of the grower, understand the implication of the calcium levels in the soil, how it affects this disorder, and how different cultivars of melons may respond to those calcium mm -hmm. treatments. And I noticed, Dennis, here you've got a seedless watermelon that, we've, that you've already cut open here. Are the seedless melons any more susceptible to uh, calcium deficiencies and blossom in rot than the others, or you just happen to have these all mixed together? No, the reason that they are in here is because in the three seasons, four seasons now that I've been growing these watermelon, I have never seen the disorder in, in the seedless melons. And they are in that study, in the study specifically for that reason, oh, to try great. to help understand why. Well, that'd be a real added benefit then if we can have a seedless watermelon. Besides that, it's resistant to blossom end rot. That'd be right. an added bonus. Yes, sir. So this then really is probably one of the things that would, that would be of interest to commercial growers. And usually we think about research as being uh, primarily for the commercial producers. Oklahoma is a fairly large watermelon producing state. I know that the things you find out in this study will benefit the growers, but exactly what, uh, what would be the, re the result or the, the end product of your research that would benefit, say, the commercial grower in Oklahoma? Well, hopefully we are going to be able to give some good advice for a commercial grower that has had a lot of problem with blossom end rot and helping him with the, the nutritional levels in his soil and amendments that he may add to that soil. And we also hope to be able to help him with cultivar selection, to choose those watermelon that under a wide range of soil conditions show the disorder mm -hmm. in a limited amount. And then ultimately, most of our research that is aimed pr primarily at commercial growers also benefits from some spinoff uh, effects of the homeowner. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if we can grow watermelons, uh, a, a higher quality melon and less expensive, this will, of course, uh, be reflected in the marketplace right. for the homeowner. But also, I would assume that the things you find out here on a commercial scale, the same principle would apply in the home garden. So if persons have trouble with blossoming right. rot, these same recommendations would be used for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I think it's a very, uh, very interesting study that you've got here, and it's a really, an, uh, really, really good looking watermelon patch. Uh, you've, had, uh, you've had a really pretty good success, I can see. And what are some of your cultural practices? I'm interested in this mulch and this uh, irrigation system you've got over here. Okay. Well. Uh, we are set up where the melons are planted in the row on a photodegradable black plastic mulch. Uh, we live in a time where uh, environmental concerns are becoming more and more important, both to the general public and to the grower. Black plastic is used a lot in the United States, but one of the problems we have is disposal of that plastic. Mm -hmm. Most of you folks would be familiar with that. This is a photodegradable mulch, meaning that it is degraded by the UV light emitted by the sun. I see. So the principle is that a grower should be able to use this mulch, get the benefit from it, the soil warming, 
the moisture retention, the weed control, and not have to dispose of that. Mm -hmm. That as the season ends, it's already uh, taken yeah. care of for you. Yeah, I noticed that in that area where you are, where there is sort of an open area, it's really decomposed. But I was looking underneath some of these vines mm -hmm. earlier. When you get really down the shade shaded area, it's not nearly as broken up or decomposed as it is in the in the rest of the patch. Right. But when these vines die down, and particularly this fall, it'll probably go pretty fast. It yeah. does. And that's part of what we're looking at is when can a grower, could he put the plastic out or a homeowner, could he put the plastic out four or five weeks before he planted or how long would he have to use, leave it there after the vine crop was gone mm -hmm. because the shading is a problem. I see. But this is a research plot and we're researching it. Right. Work. This is interesting too, it's your uh, irrigation system. Uh, yeah, we use a drip system. This is a black plastic by wall that uh, as it becomes pressurized, water is emitted through small pin type holes every foot. Uh, this works very well, uh, convenient for our research, but also in a uh, homeowner or commercial setting works very well. Mm -hmm. The calcium problems are related to moisture, as uh, most of you would be familiar. Uh, the calcium is carried in the plant through the moisture hole in the plant through transpiration. This, with the use of the drip line, we're able to maintain a very even soil moisture and uh, it works very well. I see. So it may be a combined effect of moisture fluctuations as well as calcium levels Absolutely. in the soil. Then. Absolutely. Well, Dennis, you have a lot of melons out here. You have to, I know, evaluate these on, uh, of course, the effectiveness of your application of calcium, your different levels of calcium, but also you, I'm sure you look at them from sweetness and quality and flavor and these other types of factors uh, that affect uh, what makes up a good melon. Obviously, you have to pick these things when they're ripe. Uh, how yeah. do you tell when some of these melons are ripe? Give me some tips on, and our, home, and our viewers at home, some tips on how to choose a ripe watermelon, besides plugging it. Besides plugging it. Right. Uh, actually, that's a little bit of an art, but mm -hmm. over time, I think I've gotten relatively good at it. Uh, there are four or five things that you can look at. Uh, uh, one real obvious one is, uh, is how long that melon's been on the vine. The homeowners, most of us, don't have a lot of uh, melons in the backyard and we have the time to keep track of them a little bit. If it's been 30 days that it's been there you ought to be uh, aware that that's getting close. Mm -hmm. The melon as it's younger uh, does not have very much cuticle on the outside of it and so it looks very shiny. As it matures and becomes mature it lays down a layer of cuticle of wax on the surface and it will become more dull colored and that's a very good way to tell. Is this one here probably ripe? Or getting yeah close this to one ripe? is getting very close you can tell that it is, it is a little bit more dull colored. Mm -hmm. Another way we can tell is, is what is known as the color of the ground spot, and that is, as the name indicates, just the color of the melon rind on the ground. And it should go from a more white color to more creamy. Mm -hmm. And this would be a good uh, sign in, a, in the grocery store at a right. market or at a, at a farmer's market right. to see if it's, what the color of this uh, ground color is then. Right, and this, as you can see, this does have some yellow color to it, and I'm sure mm -hmm. it's getting real close. Another indication we have, if you look at the melon, I'll turn it up on its end, there is what is called a tendril. If you follow the melon uh, vine up and come to the, from the melon up along the vine, you'll come to the very first tendril, and as that dries down is another good indication. I see. Uh, that is not as reliable as the ground color, but, uh, but works pretty well. There is one other thing that you can do. Uh, as the melon, we'll look at this seedless melon right here. Mm -hmm. If you Take the melon and hold it like that and take another hard object and tap the blossom end keeping your hand on the stem end, you should be able to feel a real nice vibration through that melon and that has to do with how ripe it is and that's, okay. that's a pretty good indicator, right? Now that, that uh, instrument that you tapped it with happens to be a knife. You're right. That you right. could unfold and cut that melon and prove to me that what you have said is correct. Are you going to do that for us? Well, we'll, we'll put my career on the line and see. Okay. Now is this a seedless watermelon? Yeah, this is a seedless. This is the tri -X seedless that has some origins right here in Oklahoma. Now you know, of course, if this melon is not ripe and it's not seedless, oh man, you're in trouble. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll trance it here. Well, I think we got pretty oh, lucky. You're, you're okay. You're okay. That's great. Dennis, we really appreciate you being with us today on Oklahoma Gardening and, and talking to us about your research. Uh, it's very interesting Glad research, and we appreciate what you do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Cut me a piece of that. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed this classic from the Oklahoma Gardening Vault. Remember, even though these tips and techniques are timeless, there's always something new to learn in the world of gardening. 
By subscribing to both Oklahoma Gardening and OK Gardening Classics, you'll have access to a wealth of gardening knowledge, both classic and contemporary.